Um, so I'm calling these two um, presentations for today and the next one, uh, split that into two parts, the mindful living part one um, and part two. Part one, we will see, we'll focus more on the exercise and the sleep aspects of our day-to-day day -day living. And part two is of course the more interesting and more also quite often more confusing and there's something always for everybody to work on is on the nutrition aspect. Now, I know that Ushanti has covered mindfulness in a lot more detail along with the CPT and various other tools. Um, and mindfulness, she has also covered topics with regards to mindfulness as a tool to a way of life in terms of um, the way we live from morning till we go to bed. So from that aspect, I'm going to look at mindful living in these four dimensions, which I call it as four very important lifestyle factors. One is the physical well-being aspect of us, which I'm breaking it into two parts, primarily the exercise and the sleep or the uh, rest component of our daily, daily living. The next is the nutritional well-being, which uh, I'd like to cover in the next uh, session. The third and the fourth are more of the placeholders. Um, emotional well-being, that's where we talk about our thoughts, emotions, feelings, stress factor, um, managing all of that. And finally, the spiritual well-being, the fundamental existential questions of our being, um, meaning and purpose of life, uh, what am I here for on this planet and things and questions of that sort. So the third and fourth, I'm sure have been covered extensively in the uh, previous um, sessions, in the, uh, in the previous two modules as well. And in the next two sessions, I will be covering the first two aspects. And this is how I would like to look at mindful living broken into these four major components. Over here, I really like to quote um, from Andrew Sewell, um, a great naturopath, saying that there is actually no magic bullet, but there is essentially a lifestyle changes that can reverse serious chronic diseases. And lifestyle factors looked at it in various uh, dimensions and um, without getting into the therapeutic aspects of it, I am going to talk about both the physical well-being and the nutritional well-being aspects uh, more from general well-being and not really for any specific um, person or any specific ailment or any specific needs. More from a general well-being point of view is what I'm going to talk about. So I will now straight away dive into the first aspect is the physical well-being part of us. And over here, I would like to put forth uh, a very quick question for everybody. Uh, what do we think is more riskier? Uh, is it uh, smoking one cigarette a day over a lifetime? Or being a couch potato for two hours per day over a lifetime? First one is A, about smoking, B, of being a couch potato. What do you think is more riskier? You may just uh, put that in your chat window if possible or um, I'll just give it 10 seconds. Okay, interesting. Now, this is this is the kind of analysis which has been actually extensively done. A research has been done on these two aspects. Uh, given the rise in the chronic ailments world over, um, and the data actually shows that so far, so that is basically being on the couch potato, can kill about 5.3 million people each year, while one cigarette a day over a lifetime 
since about five or four million people each year. So it's almost the same. So in that sense, the interesting thing is both of them are equally riskier. So being a couch potato for a long period of time or even smoking one cigarette a day are equivalent in terms of um, the health impacts that it, it has on us. And inactivity has been considered, has been analyzed, and there are several research papers in reputed journals like Lancet saying that um, inactivity has been analyzed as the fourth biggest global killer uh, the world over. So that is the kind of importance that has been given. Given the modern lifestyles, given that most of our work demand us to be sitting at one place and working for long hours, and of course we are also excited about the work, but the health impacts of that on a long-term basis are, are significant to be noticed. So the message over here is basically be aware of the chair. Uh, yes, our jobs and our works don't demand us to move, but we need to be finding out ways of making sure that we are not staying in the as a as a couch potato. But people normally feel couch potato means just sitting and watching television or watching some documentary or being on a phone or being on a device. Even if you're mentally active on your laptop is still considered as sitting on the chair and being as um, having a sedentary uh, work. So in a sense, sitting has become the new smoking. So as, as I said, both of them are equally harmful for our health. So a lot of these things, uh, these things that I'm saying, um, may not be uh, new for most of us, but I hope uh, the session helps us to get these aspects so that we re revisit these aspects and um, reanalyze our own daily routine. Let's look at it in that light. Now, of course, a sitting job or sitting work um, is definitely relaxing. So what's bad about it? What does the science say about it? why? Why is it so bad that the sitting has become the fourth biggest uh, global killer? What does the science say about it is of course the blood flow slows down significantly. And the result of that is our body's ability to process fats is also further slowed down. Body cannot break down the fat. Um, the production of certain enzymes, the lipoproteins is reduced by almost 90%. And as a result, body tends to store the fat. And the, there's also significant fatty acid that builds up in the blood vessels, which can lead to various kinds of diseases, heart diseases, or the insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, or obesity, are the most common things that we hear of because of the buildup of the fatty acids in the blood vessels. So this is something very simple, directly one can relate it, saying that the blood flow essentially slows down, which results into various things in our body. A recent uh, 2018 study showed that 82% um, of people who suffer from blood clots that for significantly greater amount of time than the remaining 18%. Now, the reference to this again comes from the Lancet Journal. The details of it can be easily found in the open source, but you can see that um, the amount of impact of the, or the people suffering from blood clots, uh, and it has been shown that there's a direct correlation with the amount of sitting activity that we do in the entire day. So with this, uh, by exercise, of course, for our physical well-being, uh, we already spoken about that, how what the decreased physical activity can do, uh, the, the various cardiovascular di disorders like hypertension, heart diseases, or uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And of course, um, 
with the kind of uh, situations in which we know that conditions like back pain, neck pain, arthritis, anxiety, various endocrine disorders, um, various menstrual disorders, um, insomnia or other things are also very common and have a very strong correlation with reduced physical activity. Now, the interesting thing is exercise is not just for physical well-being, although I have put it under physical well-being category, exercise also affects mental well-being. And this is something which I'm sure Ushanti would have covered as a part of the rewiring tools, how physical activity helps in terms of elevating our moods, in terms of getting the right amount of dopamine or the endorphins into our bloodstream. So exercise essentially helps to cultivate the neurons in your brain, encouraging them to expand and connect with other neurons. So the neuronal connectivity activity really increases with the help of exercise, the various kinds of activities that we do. I'm sure you would have also read about um, how it helps our brain if we start using our non-dominant hand. For example, if we start using our left hand for combing or maybe eating, um, there are some great ways that we can do even if we are bedridden um, and keep our uh, body moving. Exercise is in fact proven to be one of the most powerful tool and a very easy low hanging fruit is what I call it as to optimize our brain function. And the studies and the science has supported exercise for relieving various symptoms for related to ADD, OCD, anxiety, depression, various kinds of AD, uh, addictions and including the aging process. The various neurochemicals that it, um, the physical activity helps us to release is endorphins, which helps us in various pain management. And of course, dopamine, which is well known. And the newer neurochemical that I uh, try to understand from uh, Ushanti is about the BDNF, the chemical called brain-derived eutrophic factor, and which has been shown to help improve our brain performance as well as improving our memory circuits. Helps us regulate our mood with the, with the regular and moderately intense exercise. So all of this I'm saying is basically for common people, not really for um, anybody going through any therapeutic condition or, uh, or for even professional sports people, no, not for them. So now the question to all of this is, what do you think is one prescription that can lower our risk for several chronic diseases with no side effects, with zero side effects? And of course the answer is, what comes out as exercise, and this comes from the Harvard Health Publications, so sort of the most prestigious publication where one can rely on for all their health guidelines. Now with this, uh, we'll move on to the topic as how much should one exercise? Uh, that's quite a common question that I get from uh, uh, people or from my yoga participants. Um, or quite often the question comes up more like, well, I have only 20 minutes in a day. What should I do? What exercise can I do? Or I have only 30 minutes in a day. Just tell me what I can do very quickly and then come out of it. Do it as a, as a chore and finish and, and finish that. Instead of giving any number, I would put the response back onto the individual saying that one has to see what is exercise doing to us. If it is making us fatigued or tired, it means that either we're exercising too much or we are not doing the right kind of exercise, what is relevant for us, or our attitude towards exercise may not be correct. And so for some reason, we are not enjoying our exercise. Okay. So exercise will actually result in energizing us and not really making us fatigued. That's one important um, aspect that I would like to mention about 
how much to exercise. So having said that, um, minimum of 30 minutes a day to one hour is a good schedule that one should have it on a, day, on a daily basis in terms of our own exercise routine. Of course, uh, most important is based upon what is our starting point. Um, it's essential to just take small steps at a time, not really jump on to taking big steps just because it's a, a new year resolution or it's a birthday resolution and then jump on next 10 days, we do a lot of things and then the body starts picking up, we slow down and then we slow down till our next birthday. Instead of doing that, I would say taking just small steps, but most important is to maintain consistency. That is more critical rather than taking up a big step and then falling back. Taking small steps at a time, slowly increasing it, and then maintaining consistency, regular regularity is something extremely important till it becomes a part of you. For most people, I guess, um, uh, they would have already experienced how exercise helps. For some reason, because of our daily routine, um, it might uh, not have been possible, but once it becomes a part of our daily routine, um, at least what I have noticed and I have noticed with several of my uh, yoga participants is uh, when they do not do, they don't really feel comfortable at all. They're um, so much, it's like um, not having a bath and then going to work. It has become a part of, it becomes a part of that. Till that stage, yes, one, need, one needs to sort of make some um, effortful uh, practice to bring that into our daily routine. Now I'll move on to the various types of exercises very quickly. Um, so as to decide as to what type of exercise should one really uh, do. Um, the various, one is, I, I categorized here under so-called endurance kind of exercises where it helps us increase our breath, breath rate or our heart rate like jogging or brisk walking or uh, dance, aerobics, rumba, things like that. Um, swimming or fast cycling, these are essentially uh, endurance kind of exercises uh, or they are also called as cardio exercises. Then the strength exercises, which is for weightlifting or working on our certain parts of our body, typically that works, that are done in gymnasium with the help of various uh, tools. Uh, the balancing exercises, uh, very common, um, uh, sort of uh, essential, particularly on the shoulder as well, uh, which are classified primarily under gait and yoga, gait therapy, which is primarily various kind of balancing for the geriatric population. And yoga also has various balancing poses. And the flexibility exercises, which is stretching our muscles and helping us to stay limber. Things like, uh, which primarily come from uh, yoga asana practices. So these are the four, one of the ways in which you can classify the various types of exercises. Um, people tend to stick onto one versus the other instead of looking at it as good or bad. Yes, at the initial stages, uh, for career, it's more likely that one gets more attracted towards the endurance kind of exercises because it gives a very quick kick, um, a quick adrenaline rush, a, a nice sweat out, uh, really helps to elevate the mood. Uh, but just doing that alone uh, doesn't help. So what um, uh, I have learned from the Yoga Institute where I have done my courses is a good combination of one, three, and four over here, endurance, balance, and flexibility exercises, um, is what I incorporate in my yoga routine. And if, that is a good combination that I have felt, particularly for the, uh, the, the people with whom I, I work with. But essentially, of course, the focus in the yoga sessions that I do is more on the flexibility part. So um, as you can see, I'll be leaning more towards the flexibility exercises or the yoga, yogasana postures. 
but at the same time, yes, all of them definitely have their benefit. And we'll also see the differences between yoga and other forms of exercise. Now, here is another question that I'd like to put forth. What do we think is the difference between yoga star and just, um, I'm sure all of you have done some form of yoga or the other should be having in their um, schools also. Uh, I'm just talking about yoga asana, not even about pranayama or other limbs of yoga. Uh, difference between yoga asana and other forms of exercises like uh, gymnasium or jogging or aerobics uh, from a practice point of view. Because I would say that certain things can be very common um, between various things. Yes, Jana, yes, Yogasana is definitely about relaxation, strength, stamina. Uh, Yogasana doesn't work as much directly on the muscular strength as much as the flexibility aspect of it. The strength is an indirect effect of long-term yoga practice. But what I liked about the response is the most important aspect is on the breathing. Breathing is a great, uh, is a major difference uh, between yogasana and other forms of exercises. Sorry, I'd like to remove my uh, background. So that things that I wanted to emphasize makes it very clear. Now, there may be, let's look at a very simple practice. If you're doing, let's say we are just taking our hands in and out, taking, stretching our arms out and taking it in. Now, this very simple practice is there in all forms of exercise. Even in our so-called PT class in our school, we have been taught about doing this hands in and out practice. But the most important part in yoga asana, when we are doing this as a part of yoga practice, is consciously keeping our awareness towards breath. When we are doing any of the physical movements, breath has to be coordinated with all the physical movements and consciously making sure that even our hands in and out movement. So when we are taking our arms away, we are inhaling. And when we are taking our arms closer, we are exhaling. Even the simple body movements, we are consciously making sure that we do it in coordination with our breath. And that makes a huge difference between doing the same posture, just like any other exercises versus doing it as a part of yoga sana practice. Because as we all know, breath is a very strong bridge between our mind and body. So it's a, it's a great window to also understand and to calm down our mind if we are able to focus on our breath as we are doing our exercise. If we are doing the same thing mechanically, hand in and out movement or doing some arm rotation movement and things like that, fine, it's not that we won't get any benefits, but those benefits will remain primarily at a physical level. While if you're doing it, coordinating our movements with our breath, you may be doing very simple movements like your shoulder movements, for example, taking your shoulders up and down. But if you're coordinating with our breath, if we're kneeling when our shoulders go up, when our elbows go up and if we're exhaling when they come down, it has a much different impact on our mind, body, and our overall well-being. So most important aspect is breath. This is a, a quite common aspect that people, uh, my yoga participants come and ask, saying that, well, I also do on my own exactly the same practices that uh, you tell me to do it in the class along with the group session, but I don't have the same impact. And um, of course, when, I, when they're doing it along uh, with me, uh, I keep emphasizing on the breath aspect as to when to inhale and when to exhale. But when they're doing it on themselves, the mind takes its own tour. Uh, that's very natural unless we try to bring it back onto the breath and coordinate all our activities with the breath. So 
as you know, breath is um, can also be controlled both by our sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So breath, using that breath is a very strong bridge and which helps us enormously um, in our overall well-being. So I like this quote from Eckhart Tolle, which says that, be aware for breathing. Notice how this takes attention away from our thinking and creates a space within us. One of my favorite quotes is from B.K. Sanyangar, saying that yoga teaches us to cure what did not be endured and endure what cannot be cured. Something very deep and of course very philosophical, but we'll not go there. Uh, we'll stay to more practical aspects. Uh, we'll just leave that for our own self-reflection. And just focus very quickly on the research on yoga. Um, in last about 20 to 25 years, uh, there has been a huge plethora of research being done world over, um, as usual, more in the West than here, on the effects of yoga on our um, on our overall well-being, as well as for reversing certain uh, chronic diseases. At a physical level, of course, it improves flexibility. It does help in pain management, reducing our aches and pains. It reduces our breath and heart rates. It lowers down our stress level, our cortisol levels, lowers our blood pressure down. There are, of course, some certain specific exercises which does help in lowering the blood pressure. Um, reduces stress and anxiety, and it can improve various pre-existing medical conditions. And there's a reference below uh, from where I basically captured all of this. Now, the same thing I would like to respond in a slightly more technical way as to what happens with the help of yoga from a physiology point of view, um, compared to other forms of exercises. After a good yoga session, one will actually notice that our respiratory rate actually goes down. So the breath becomes more deeper and the breath rate slows down. So that's what I'm saying, but the respiratory rate actually slows down. Metabolic rate goes down. Again, it, there could be a lot of confusion behind what does it mean by metabolic rate goes down. I would say that our overall energy levels go up. And as a result of it, we can do the same amount of thing by burning less amount of calories. This is how one should look at it in terms of metabolic rate going down. Uh, the body's need for oxygen also goes down, natural need. Uh, some of you might have noticed after a good yoga session, um, which typically an end of yoga session is followed by a uh, relaxation or a yoga nidra kind of session um, practice. The body temperature goes down. Overall, there is also relaxation at the mind level, of course, at the mental level. And the specific effect on various glands, um, certain yoga postures like the Durasana or Artha Matsendrasana have been found to have specific effect on adrenal glands or pineal glands and so on. So there's also uh, some very strong correlation about how the hormones secreted by various glands can be enhanced with the help of certain yoga postures. And the prescriptions like these coming straight away from an MD doctor these days have now become common. And I hope that they also start becoming common in our Indian context, where uh, doctors who are looking at it truly holistically, um, other than the, the medicines that they need to give, 
um, depending on your health situation, they also look at the other lifestyle factors. One of them is primarily the exercise aspect. I would also like to talk about a typical, what should a typical yoga sequence comprise of? Um, very quickly, um, some of you would have already uh, be doing it in some yoga sessions or in your school, but typically we know that a yoga sequence starts with settling down and something like mindful breathing or some opening prayer. Uh, before jumping on to any major yoga poses, we do the loosening of all the major joints, right from toes to the neck, throughout the body. Now then I would recommend that we do some sort of, for a very short duration, maybe five minutes or so, what I'm calling it as dynamic practice, which helps to enhance our breath rate, enhance our heart rate, and actually feel what's happening with the help of simple dynamic practice, which could be even things like uh, spot jogging or things like bend and take twist, or just simple a forward and backward movement or doing some sit-ups very quickly. Although they are not under classical yoga, but doing those help before we actually venture into the proper yoga poses. Then I'm calling it as lumbar stretches, the kind of practices that one does when one is lying, in, uh, lying flat on the yoga mat and doing, doing the practices in the supine posture, various uh, uh, yoga poses that you can do in this, uh, the supine posture in Shavasana. That's, um, I'm calling that as lumbar stretches. Um, then we do Surya Namaskara, at least one or two Surya Namaskaras to be done very slowly, observing and feeling every aspect of every pose in which we are. Um, and then doing at least about minimum of four, maximum of 10, 12, depending upon where we are, uh, how frequently we do doing the Surya Namaskara poses. Before ending, at least doing one or two balancing practices uh, definitely helps, or you can even choose to do any asanas that you need for your own specific health condition. Now the things that typically tends to get missed out when people do it individually is a relaxation technique. Um, we, in some sense, in the kind of modern um, rut or the lifestyle that we are in, um, somehow uh, there has been a belief factor probably which has unconsciously got set in saying that or relaxation in the end is a waste of time. I rather do something more productive uh, and do the activity. And I have seen that people who have initially joined the yoga sessions tend to quickly skip those shavasana, skip those relaxation. But I would say that's extremely important if you want to do a full proper yoga session. So even if you have only 30 minutes in a day to do yoga, you can actually split your time very nicely covering all of this, including giving yourself time to cool down, to, to relax before you finish your yoga session. Now, after the guided relaxation or self-relaxation, you do pranayama and end the session with any closing prayer. This is what I um, normally recommend as a typical yoga sequence for general well-being. I'm not saying from a therapeutic point of view, there can be variations. Uh, if one is looking at it as a yoga therapy, um, that has to be taken on a case-to-case -case basis. But this is more for a general well-being. Now with that, um, I'll move on to the next, next important topic is the topic with regards to rest or the sleep and the essential and the importance of sleep in our daily routine. And today we have a lot of research that has happened and this is straight from a uh, book by Matthew Walker, director of Center for Human Sleep Sciences from University of California. And I really like his quote, the best bridge between despair and hope is a good night's sleep. 
get up fresh in the morning, forgetting about everything and starting the day fresh. That's the best bridge between despair and hope. Again, um, I'm just trying to preempt some of the questions that I have had in the, from the previous uh, similar presentations. The question that comes up is how much should one sleep? Should I sleep six hours, seven hours, eight hours? How much should I sleep? The response to that again is, I would say that the quality of sleep is more important really than the quantity of sleep. As long as when one gets up, one feels energized to fresh and fresh to start the day, that means we had a good night's sleep. That should be our yardstick rather than just trying to measure as to how much should be the duration for the sleep. Of course, having said that, uh, typically six to eight hours of sleep is considered uh, fairly good for most people. Uh, in order to, uh, if it's a good night sleep, so that we can start the day afresh and we feel energized and not really carrying lethargy from the previous day or some headaches from the previous day or some aches and pains in your body without any of that. Okay, some uh, quick and important factors about sleep hygiene very essential for those who suffer from situations like insomnia or sleep, various kinds of sleep disorders is aligning our sleep cycle with the solar cycle. What that basically means is, yes, when the night, go to bed, avoid late night calls, avoid um, BPO's kind of activities, minimize it if one can, or come out of it as soon as one can. Uh, where one, one is constantly working with different time zones. Um, keep a consistent sleep, sleep routine. So what that means is basically waking up at the same time each day does help significantly in maintaining our body's internal cycle internal melatonin cycle and even our internal biological clock, which is very closely aligned with our solar cycle. And that helps um, a great deal in terms of our sleep hygiene. Avoiding various kinds of stimulants like tea, coffee, at least two hours before you go to bed. Minimizing various bright lights. Now, this is very difficult. I guess I know that uh, in our today's life, uh, bright light and blue lights, uh, the backlight emitting gadgets like uh, mobiles or computers or TVs for at least two hours before the scheduled time for sleep. And uh, with a lot of research that has been done, lighting that has been shown that how these blue lights actually affect our melatonin cycle and how it can affect our quality of sleep. Very simple thing that our, that our grandmothers would have always told in terms of calming down the mind, whatever techniques one wants to use, a prayer or a meditation or a guided relaxation or taking a bath if one needs to. We already spoke about minimal lights. Of course, avoiding activities that activates mind. So avoiding acti any activities that we know are any discussions that we know are not going to be easy or going to be stressful and going to bed with at least two to three hours gap after dinner. This is again equally critical because if you get into the habit of having food and immediately within less than two hours uh, going for sleep, it affects internally uh, our digestion, which in the long term affects our mood you can try out various some of the experiments saying that have a heavy dinner and then immediately go to sleep. Figure out how our mood feels like the, the next day. Or even if you have a heavy dinner and just leave about two to three hours gap, you won't have enough time for that um, 
put to get assimilated into the body, digested into the body, find out what happens um, to hormones the next day, even if we had a good night's sleep. So um, the dinner particularly has to be very critical. We'll talk about those aspects in the next session, but as a general rule of thumb, at least keep two hours gap after dinner and before we go to bed. I would like to end with this. Uh, how our mind tends to justify about relaxation, saying that even relaxing, we want to do it better and faster. And we want to be on the cutting edge of relaxation, in the name of efficiency. But unfortunately, body is a very organic and a biological system. Um, it needs its own time. Uh, to be able to be fully relaxed. And there, yes, we cannot have any uh, quick fixes in terms of relaxing very quickly. Okay, I would like to end with this. Um, just a quote from, I think it comes from Mahatma Gandhi saying that an ounce of practice is much powerful than tons of theory. That's all I had. Uh, thanks, Mary, Ramesh, and others for 